Hi friends, welcome back. My name is Clint Hoagland and this is Creating Electronic Music with Chuck. In our last video, we talked about pulse oscillators and how you can make classic synth sounds by modulating their pulse width. In video number 30, we looked into some fun things you can do while reading from text files, including using them to sequence melodies. In this video, we're going to try out some creative ways to use text files that we write to disk during our Chuck programs. So what we have here is a file that I've just copied from the examples directory underneath the Chuck distribution. Let's go through this thing line by line. On line one, we've got, we're declaring an object called fout, and that is of the type file IO. And then we open for writing a file, as uh, we're going to call the dot open method on that fout object. Note that I have the folder open over here, and there is no file called out.txt in there. After the comma, uh, just like we did when we opened the when we opened the files for reading, we uh, did the uh, file io dot read, and now we're going to do file io dot write. Uh, next, we can test to see whether or not the file is ready to be written to. There is a property called dot good parenthesis, and uh, if that is not good, the exclamation point means not, so not good, then throw an uh, error to the console and exit the program. Next, on uh, line 14, we're going to write some stuff. Now, this is something that we have not seen yet. This is specific for writing to files. Th these operators here, this one here, this one here, 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 and here, and here, these are called backchuck operators. And I think that this is the only place in which you see backchuck operators. Ordinarily, this would be like a less than or equal to sign. But what this does is it makes it so that you can have a nice readable set of things that go into a file. So rather than having all of these things go into a file, at the, at, uh, get chucked to the F out at the end, they go left into it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do one, and then a space, then a two, then another space, then the word foo, and then io.newline. So I'm going to run this thing. Let me chuck. File output test one. And note that now there is an out.txt in my directory. If I click on that, what did it do? One space two space foo. Let's do that whole thing again. We're going to close that file. And we're going to run it again. Out.txt is back. And now there are two lines. If we were to remove the new line from these, save it up and run it again. I'm going to close this editor and then run it again and look at it again. One, two, foo, one, two, foo. No new line. OK. And if we look at uh, follow up output test two, same thing. So if we write some stuff, uh, this is all the same. We open up a file out, a file IO object with file dot write. File IO dot write is its second property. Out to dot txt, which currently does not exist. Check to see if it's ready for writing. If it is, skip this part and then write some stuff. It's going to call a write property three times. And then we're going, then it closes the file. Let's try checking to file output test two. It created an out two dot txt, and that was one two boo. Once again, if we look at two, one two boo, no spaces, one two boo. So they all printed to the same line, and I think that that's why that's in that example folder. Lastly, this one is not in the sample folder, uh, but I made this. So I got a file IO. Oh, let's get rid of this comment. We know what these things are doing now. I make a file IO object called f out, and I open out3.txt. Actually, I'm going to put this inside this for loop. I'm going to make a for loop that goes from 1 to 1,000. I'm going to save it up, 
and then I'm going to run this. Now, I want you to pay attention to how long this takes when I run this. So I'm going to go three, two, one, run it. And it took a while to get that done. A couple. So first, let's look at it. It went from one to 1000 and it just printed I and then a new line into that file. If we go to out3.txt, here are all of those. We get the line number followed by the actual number that it printed. And it does that 1,000 times. We can scroll down to see that. Finishes at 1,000. And oh, I had another new line. So it's 1,001 lines in the file. OK, so if we're looking at this line here, it's a little bit different than before. If we're doing file io.append rather than writing this thing, uh, rather than doing file io.write. What that means is when it opens the file, rather than overwriting everything that's in the file, what it's going to do is it's going to append the, what you're putting to the bottom of the file. So let's run this thing again. And it takes a while for execution to come back, just like last time. And then if we look back in out3.txt, we're on line 1000, on line 1001, it starts at one again. And now this file has 2000 lines in it. On line 2000, we printed 1000. Now note that that took a little while. And the reason why is because opening files and closing files takes a little bit. However, it doesn't need to take that long. If we just put the, the file IO open and close methods, outside of our while loop and save it up again, I'm going to run this for a third time and watch how long it takes for file execution to come back. Less than a second. Now, if we look in out three once again, if we go all the way down to line three, uh, uh, 2000, yeah, so we started on line 2000, 2001, is a one again, so it started again. So what that tells us is appending to the file is virtually instantaneous once the file is open. So what you want to do, if you want to print a lot of stuff to a file, then you can just do that while the file is open. And then once you're done writing to the file completely, you can close the file and you can write very quickly to a file by using file io.append. So here we have a test setup that should be familiar if you've been following these tutorials. I've got a sign oscillator going into an envelope, into a panner, into a stereo reverb array, and into the digital audio converter. Then um, setting the gain for the oscillator, setting the envelope for the, uh, yeah, setting the times for the envelope, setting the mix for the reverbs, making a uh, set of tones, like basically like a minor seventh thing for the notes setting a base offset, setting a position of zero, and then we're gonna randomize the position, which is randomizing the octaves. We're gonna randomize our way through the notes array to it plus the position plus the offset to get your uh, frequency for your oscillator. Then we are panning randomly and we are setting the de decay time randomly. And then we're going to advance time every 125 milliseconds. It sounds like this. So we're, here we have the same file. Uh, I've added a couple of things. First, we've got a file I.O. here, uh, and the object's called part file. I open it up to part.txt. That does not exist, just does not exist yet, pardon me. And then down inside our loop, I changed my loop to only go for 256 steps instead of going forever. And then I've moved some things around a little bit so it was easier to get at the values and then I added them into these this backchuck string, this series of backchucks, dumping things into the part file. 
and then we the uh, same time and then once the loop is done we close out the part file and now let's launch this and listen to that and see what it spits out All right, let's take a look at the part file. And it spit out a line for every one of those notes. We can scroll down and we can see that it, there are 256 of them, which if I'm doing my math right, would have been 16 bars of 16th notes. So each row has got a note number and then a pan value, which is a float, and then a decay time which was the number of milliseconds that the decay time took or was specified for that particular note. So here's a second version of that file that instead of writing to a file, it reads from the part.txt file. So it's got the file IO it once again. It opens it up with the read property. And then instead of uh, calculating all of those values for the note, the pan position, and the decay, it just drags them out of the part file. So like we saw in the other file tutorial in video number 30, we can just uh, iterate across this file and get all of these things right back out of that file at part.txt, which we looked at a minute ago right here. So the first thing, the first number in the file is going to be an int, second one's going to be float, third one's an int, and then it just keep, keeps on going. Uh, spaces and new lines are all delimiters. So yeah, so the this note goes into the frequency, the pan position goes to the, the panner's pan, and then the decay gets converted to milliseconds and goes to the decay time. We still kick the envelope and we still go 125 milliseconds. Now let's play this file. So you might be reasonably asking yourself, what is the purpose of doing this? It's possible to record your randomly chosen, uh, randomly generated ch Chuck music into a WAV file and just play it back. So why would you bother to do this thing where you fill the file up with numbers? And the answer is that, as, as you might have noticed, when we were doing the file reading tutorial, You've got a file that's full of numbers and it can easily read it, but actually populating that thing with numbers is still a lot of typing. And you might not necessarily want to do all that typing and copying and pasting. And so what this allows you to do, I've, I've got a, my part text here and I've got a, I backed it up into this file here. So let's delete everything after line eight. And we're just gonna copy and paste this. And we're going to save it up. We're going to play it four times so you can, just so you can hear what it's going to sound like if we've got this thing happening four times. I don't know what it's going to sound like, but we're going to hear it. So already a, a loop like that starts to be somewhat of a more interesting sound than pure randomness, but then we can continue to sculpt it and let's say, uh, let's say we wanted this one to be 40 like that. And we can start to think of, this is sort of, sort of like a big piece of clay that you can then start to sculpt into something a little bit more interesting, right? So let's make that 30 and we'll Do that. So if we if we do we make that one alteration there, and how about we do that too? And we'll play it back again. So 
so that you, you heard that it did a, a bit of an interesting thing there and like randomness could have caused that to happen but you can also say well randomness didn't give me exactly what i was hoping for so i am going to impose my will on that randomness let's make, make that one positive um let's do the same thing here actually we'll, we'll make this uh 72 and 70 and 70 and 70 again but we're gonna let the other panning stuff in the uh, decay time thing change itself and see what that sounds like. So ending with that doo doo at the end with the 70 to 72 is pretty nice. So I'm gonna do that again and uh, maybe we'll do 72 70 at the beginning of this one. And we'll. Uh, Make that one long with this one short and see what we got there. Mm, I think I want this one to drop down an octave. Try that again. Well, I want both of these things to be down an octave. So this is going to be 58, and this one's going to be 60. D, and we'll make this one 58 as well, and this is really short, so we're going to make that 30. Oop, I wanted this to be 60 and I wrote 50. So it, it it's not it, it, adhering to my rules of my chords thing if I just change it in this file. Uh, so then if we wanted to make uh, jump into our 4b file which is here we could um, throw this whole thing in a while true and I don't remember exactly the way to make it jump back to the beginning but we can look at our file test from last week to look at that zero to seek and it goes zero to part file dot seek and uh, close that and now we can get a, uh, got a thing that will make a loop that goes forever oh <laughs> So it turned out that that happened because there was another line break at the end of this thing, and so the file wasn't over when it got back to, to the end of that while loop. So it jumped back up and it tried to start reading stuff from right here, but that uh, there was nothing for it to read, so it blew up. So the, to solve that problem, if it happens to you, is just to delete that last, last line from your file, and then you can play it, and it sounds like, mine sounds like this. So, you know, there's nothing particularly special about that loop, but it's uh, it, it, it illustrates the point that you can start with some randomness and then sculpt that randomness into something that you might find more interesting or appealing. Okay, this last thing I wanted to talk about is a idea of making a step sequencer uh, using your own keyboard. So what I've got here is I've got a file called File Output Test 5 and another one called File Output Test 5B. And what File Output Test 5 does is it's got a loop that uh, gets the uh, keyboard input like we talked about in the events video. And if it gets a key down message, then it handles key, goes into a method called handle key press. That is a gigantic method. I'm going to put this uh, code up on GitHub so that you can just pull it down and use it at your leisure because there's a bunch of typing and there's like it's... There was nothing interesting about the typing piece of it. It's just I had to like handle every key that I needed. Uh, but yeah, so handle key press takes a uh, a key's which value, and then I uh, oh this is oh 
What just happened? There we go. Um, this is Z. And this is Y. And I figured that out just by uh, using the code from that events tutorial. So there's an off offset that starts out as 60. We'll go through that, some of that stuff too. Um, and then if you press the Z key on your keyboard, then you change the offset by minus 12. And if you press the Y key, you change the offset by plus 12. And the offset, uh, we just have that thing called set offset. And it takes the offset that we put into that method back there and changes the offset to the new offset. And then it prints that to the console. So that's those two things. Uh, next thing, these are all the uh, the keys for your uh, the the numbers at the top of your keyboard, and uh, the escape key is actually one, and then one is two, and so so on and so forth. So these are all just setting different divisor values, and uh, when it when the time comes, I'll uh, I can show you how that works inside the the loop when it starts starts running. And then finally, I got a computer keyboard. I stole this idea from Ableton's uh, computer keyboard. So like A is C, and S is D, D is E, and so on and so forth. And then the uh, the black notes are like like W and E. Uh, it, it like yeah. So you, you'll see how that works when I run it too. These are all down there. A bunch of handle notes thing for each of these possible. Uh, notes and then if I hit the P key then that puts in a rest and then if I hit the escape key then it changes the keep going value to zero which means that it exits the while, while loop and closes the file and at the top of this thing uh, we just got we're setting up the file uh, we're you know creating our variables setting the divisor setting the offset got a little bit of a uh, a beeper thing so that we can t uh, hear what we're doing. And uh, let's run this file. So it says the divisor is 16, the offset is 60, keyboard is ready, and the step se sequencers are waiting for in input for part.txt. So I'm just going to hit my A key, hit my D key, G key, K key. And then we'll just like go do. And so that did 16th notes. And then I'm going to hit escape. Wrote it to part.txt. And then we can look at part.txt. And you can see all the things that I just uh, typed in there. Now, file output test 5b. If you saw the. Uh, the reading from files video, then this should look familiar to you. So what it does is it, uh, if it finds a rest, then it does a process comment. If it finds an R, then it processes the rest. And if it finds, uh, if the line is longer, else if the line is longer than zero, then uh, process the note, and then it closes it. And if you want to go back to the beginning, you just open it back up. And these are the exact same things that I took from that tutorial uh, about uh, file input. So let's run this file. Okay, that worked great. So now let's try uh, changing the divisor. So I'm going to run the file output test five chuck file again. And then I'm going to uh, put, uh, touch the four key, change the divisor to four, so that's a quarter note, and let's do an F. And now eight. Uh, let's do, yeah. And then back to that, and we'll do, and then I hit escape. And then I can just run the other file again, and what does it, what does it do? Yep, 
Yeah, so that's how you can make your own step sequencer. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, things that you could do to make your own uh, output part files and make use of that. Uh, things that come to mind would be like doing the brake chopper thing with this. Uh, additionally, you could, of course, you could, instead of using your computer keyboard, you could use a MIDI keyboard to input notes. Uh, yeah, sky's the limit. Uh, but uh, yeah, some, these are just some fun things that you can do with file output and also file input. In this video, we discuss some fun ways to use exported text files in our Chuck music. In the next video, we're going to introduce open sound control and show how you can control other programs and even other computers from Chuck.